Hello, I'm Infamous Fear, and this is Period Drama Drama. Horses. I love them, but I've never been one of the fancy few who owned one. Over time, horses have changed in significance from being a near necessity to being an expensive extravagance. Ever since the people in Central Asia tamed the stocky primitive equids native to the area, horses have been used in transport and in warfare. They were often brutally treated and neglected, as shown in books like Black Beauty, which, contrary to popular belief, is a protest against the ill treatment of horses, rather than an overly sentimental pony book. In more modern fiction, however, horses have a certain mystique around them. Frequently the horse is described as being particularly special. Maybe the human protagonist is the only one who can tame their wild ways. Now, I may love horses, but I don't think I'm that overly sentimental about them either. Oh, and you know what else isn't sentimental? World War One. World War I is commonly remembered as one of the most brutal, pointless losses of human life in recent history. So much so that here in Australia, the anniversary we choose to commemorate is one of a horrible defeat. We commemorate this defeat with biscuits. In World War I, the powers that be decided to try out a new form of warfare. The modern world was advancing and the cavalry charges that most armies were used to had been met with horrible results in the earlier Crimean War. Top tip, cavalry charges don't tend to work against heavy artillery. The recent Boer War had also introduced the concept of guerrilla warfare rather than both armies arranging to meet on a battlefield in a certain time and charging at each other. So the armies decided to try some new techniques. Trench warfare! Chemical weapons! Melting down the fat from horse carcasses to create bombs! But of course, this is a horse story, and a kid's one at that, so it's time we tried a different tack. Ha uh ha, -huh, only three people got that joke. Time to go back to that sunny sentimentality. Time to hit the story with a dose of Spielberg. This is War Horse. My horse is was based on a 1982 children's book by Michael Morpurgo. It later got turned into a play. Ugh, why am I getting cold shivers of foreboding at this? Oh, that's right, because most of the things that get turned into plays later end up being awful movies. But anyway... The movie starts with the titular horse being born. This is an impressive feat, seeing that the horse shown in labour isn't even pregnant. Really? You couldn't get a pregnant mare for this scene? Was it that hard to find a pregnant bay mare? Oh, so it turns out that the mare in labour in this scene was played by none other than Finder's Key. The very same Finder's Key who plays Joey, the star of the film, later in the movie. He's giving birth to himself! Does this remind you of anything? Narracott and his father Ted go to a horse auction, supposedly to pick up a shy horse to help plough their property. Now that's a beauty. Forget it, Ted. He's our thoroughbred. Not got a day's work in him. Now there. There's your ticket. Oh, all right then. Coming this summer, an epic tale of bravery and strength. Shire Horse. Wow, he sure is good at ploughing. Of course, that's not what happens. Ted, who realises that Albert has fallen in love with the beautiful cult Jesus we saw earlier, decides to pay a ridiculous amount for the thoroughbred instead of buying a more practical and cheaper shire. Okay, okay, sorry to interrupt the story so soon, but this is something that really bugs me. Why is it that some breeds of horses are considered more beautiful, more stunning, and on the whole, more worthy than others? Yes, Shire horses are considerably larger and more clunky than thoroughbreds, but there's a lot to be said for a horse that isn't highly strung and has feathery feet. How can you not love feathery feet? Blah blah, Albert's mother isn't pleased about the purchase, but she changes her mind when Albert breaks Jesus, sorry, I mean Joey, for the plough, and they plough a rocky field in a dramatic and ridiculous way, so that Ted can grow some turnips and pay off his debt to the landlord. Of course, the turnips fail. How else are we going to pay Mr. Lyons' rent? Oh, I never saw that coming! 
Then the army come to the town looking for horses. To pay the rent, Ted sells Joey to Captain Nichols. Albert is heartbroken. He tries to enlist in the army to go with Joey, but he's too young, so Captain Nichols promises to look after Joey for him. Albert ties a MacGuffin to Joey in the form of his father's Boer War regimental pennant. We then see some filler crap in the form of Sergeant Benedict Cumberbatch having a race with Captain Nichols, so we can see firsthand just how awesome Horse Jesus is. And this. What are you up to? I'm writing a letter. With a picture in it? <laughs> it's to the boy who owned Joey. I want to show him how wonderful he's looking. Really, how likely is it that Captain Nichols is an accomplished equine artist? Joey bonds with Topthorn, Benedict Cumberbatch's horse, and then the two are involved in a ridiculously suicidal cavalry charge. Surprise, surprise! Sergeant Benedict and Captain Nichols are killed. Joey and Topthorn are then acquired by the German army, where they are looked after by Mikhail and Gunther, who are speaking English. Well, well, look at you. Whoever told you this has just saved your life. Ugh! For the love of God, this is stupid! I know this is a children's story, I know! But children who are old enough for this kind of violence are old enough to read subtitles! So Mikhail and Gunther speak to each other in their dumb, fake German accents and decide to desert the army, taking the horses with them. They race away and hide in a building near a windmill, where they get caught and shot the next day. Then what follows is the stupidest, most cheesy bit in the movie. This is Keanu with a chocolate suitcase levels of cheesiness. If I had my way, this whole next section would have been cut. Joey and Topthorn are found by a precocious orphan girl who lives with her grandfather like fucking Heidi. Do you think I'll die if you tell me the truth? The truth is... You should speak to your elders with respect. Apparently she's got some kind of mysterious disease, like glass bones TB or something, but it doesn't seem to stop her from looking surprisingly healthy. Emily, look at me. You cannot try it. Mother used to tell me how my bones would give way by yes, the slightest bump of that's form. Right. So. She begs her grandfather to keep the two horses in English, despite the fact that both of them are French. However, then the evil, nasty Germans come back. Where's the livestock? I make jam. We have no animals. But there's fresh hay in your barn. We use it to replace the matter stuffings. You might have fought him. What is that? The wind, it plays tricks in the attic. We will be back. I'll be back. Wait a minute, how come they didn't shit up there? How come there wasn't any shit in the fresh straw the Germans found? I know this is a kid's movie, but come on! Kids know that animals defecate. There's even children's books about it. Terrible! So Emily is allowed to hide the horses for now, but later when she's learning to ride them, the Germans find the horses and take them back like the meanies they are. Please, take the bigger one and leave the smaller one. You're breaking my granddaughter's heart. The war is taking everything from everyone. What will happen to them? They will pull artillery until they die, or until the war is over. It will never be over! How terrible. Oh, for the love of God, I'm going to have to speed this up. It's going to take me forever to get through the plot like this. Joey and Topthorn are forced to pull guns for the German force, and they quickly lose a lot of condition and see lots of horses die around them. Hook him up. How do you see, sir? This one is stronger. <laughs> Time then skips to 1918, near the end of the war. Albert has enlisted and is in the trenches where he gets caught in a mustard gas attack. Meanwhile, Joey has an emotional death scene with Topthorn, seeing as Topthorn was the closest thing that this movie had to being a love interest. <laughs> Joey then escapes and bolts across the battlefield. <laughs> Entangled and barbed wire in the middle of
of No Man's Land, a plot point lifted straight out of my friend Flicker. Well, bugger me. It's a horse. Listen to him, sir. We can't leave him. What's he doing? It's a trap. No, I don't think so. A German and an English soldier collaborate to cut Joey free and then flip a coin to see who gets to keep him. Unsurprisingly, the English guy wins and takes Joey to a British medical camp where he is reunited with Albert in a scene which you pretty much could have predicted from the beginning of the movie. Then we briefly see the grandfather again as he buys Joey at an auction. He then randomly gives Joey to Albert and blah blah, Joey and Albert return home and oh whatever, who cares the end? So now that we've gone through the whole plot, how did Warhorse do in terms of historical accuracy, costumes, setting and characters? This movie is a very sentimental one, which is obvious when you look at the depiction of its characters. The main human character, Albert, is an honest, hard-working lad, whereas his landlord and the landlord's son are depicted as snooty and rude. I'm the only boy that drives in the village. No one else drives but me, that's right. And this is my dad's car. <laughs> Later in the film, we are shown good Germans as opposed to evil Germans. Good Germans desert, and evil Germans laugh mercilessly as they stick their fingers in jam. Nowhere is a character depicted so cartoonishly good and innocent as in the awful treacly scenes with Emily and her grandfather. This is Francois, and this is Claude. Mm. I named them after two boys who broke my heart last summer. When the war is over, then you can buy me jewels and carriages. Anything you say, my sweet one. Anything you say. The film endeavours to show the humanity of both sides of the conflict, particularly with the Christmas truce-styled encounter when the German and English forces collaborate to free Joey from the wire. You see, he's horse Jesus and he brings everyone together. However, apart from the first cavalry charge, where Captain Nichols is killed, what this film fails to show is that in the First World War, there were no winners. Have fun with your PTSD, Albert! The setting is absolutely beautiful, when it needs to be, with gorgeous views of Devon and a good representation of the ravaged horror of the trenches. At times the lighting used is rather too golden and honey drenched, but the cinematography is still fabulously done. The costumes look pretty good, showing a nice array of military uniforms and the lower class clothing at the end of the Edwardian period. I can't really fault this movie for budget for one, and the costumes certainly don't look cheap. Neither did they skimp on the extras. All the actions on screen were actually done, and I can't fault the work of the horses and the horse trainers in the making of this film. This is a true epic movie. It's just a shame it had to be so cheesy. That's Captain Nichols' sketchbook. See that? That's a picture of Joey. It's a picture of Joey. This is the first live-action Spielberg film I've ever seen, and I can't say I'll be lining up to see any more. War Horse was painfully sentimental. It was cliché, it was cheesy, and the overall effect was like something that came off the front of a chocolate box. We've seen this kind of thing before on period drama drama. One man and the powerful spiritual bond he had with an animal, and a vineyard, and some Mexicans. Coming this summer, a war horse in the clouds. Well, at least Finder's Key was a better actor than Keanu. So that was War Horse, and over the course of this review, I've learned one very powerful message. Do you have any idea how heavy this thing is? War is hell. Walker sees the light.